You're probably familiar with the poem, uh, The Road Not Taken, by Robert Frost. If not, it's fairly short, so I'm going to read it for you. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trod in black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So that's a well-known poem. It's by Robert Frost, a, a well-known American poem. Um, and it talks about uh, the, the traveler, the speaker, traveling along on a road in the woods, and he comes to a fork in the road. So there's a divergence, and the two paths look pretty similar. They're, you know, they're meeting at the same point. And so the speaker ends up choosing one, but he knows he will not come back to ever take the other path. But he has chosen his path, and that's the one he takes, and he says that has made all the difference. So those two paths started out very close together. In fact, they came together, they met, they touched. But the, the paths diverge, so he takes one path and, and he doesn't come back to the other. And so that's the way it is when two things diverge, one from the other. They start out very close together, they look very similar, but as you go down those two paths, you can end up in two very, very different places. And so that's kind of the way it is with heresies. They start out looking pretty similar uh, to, to the truth, but if you continue down that path, you end up some, somewhere very, very different. Um, so if we look back very quickly at some of the, the heresies that we've discussed so far, uh, if we want to talk about Gnosticism, a Gnostic believes in Jesus, okay, all right, we're on the same track, right? Well, if you keep going, you'll find out, well, to them, to the Gnostic, Jesus is a multi-generational emanation from the supreme being who is distinct from Yahweh. Okay, so they might call him Jesus, but they really don't believe in, in the true Jesus. Okay, so you end up somewhere very different. Um, we talked about Marcionism. The Marcionist accepts the New Testament. Okay, all right, sounds good, right? Well, if we keep going, uh, we find out that they deny the Old Testament, and so they basically have, have everything wrong. Um, end up somewhere very different. With modalism, they say, okay, yeah, we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Sounds good. But if you keep going, we find out that they see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as just roles that, that God plays and not distinct persons. Okay, so again, we end up somewhere very different. And then last week, we talked about Arianism. Well, they, they acknowledge that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct, um, distinct persons. Okay, sounds like we're on the right path. Well, not really, because if we keep going, we find that they would say that the Son and the Holy Spirit are not eternal God, but are creations of God, okay? So once again, we end up somewhere very different, somewhere very wrong. So last week we talked about uh, Arianism, propagated by a man named Arius, and Arius was um, staunchly opposed by a man named Athanasius. And Athanasius, at one point, was vastly outnumbered. Uh, Pastor Taylor gave us the, the phrase, Athanasius contra mundo, Athanasius against the world. So, obviously, that, was, that, that phrase is a little bit of hyperbole. Athanasius wasn't the only one standing for the truth. Uh, one, of, one of his friends, or one of his allies, one of the people that was standing beside him, was a man by the name of Apollinaris. So Apollinaris was uh, an ardent supporter of the concept of hom uh, homoousius, saying that God is the same, the Son is the same substance as the Father. And uh, um, Apollinaris was instrumental in the defeat of Arianism. He was also a bishop of Laodicea, and he was a scholar who worked to ensure the academic influence of Christians in the fourth century. He published numerous Bible commentaries and critiques of pagan philosophy. Okay, so this Apollinaris guy sounds like a pretty good guy, pretty stand-up guy. He wasn't an Arian heretic. Unfortunately, 
he was a proponent of another heresy, one that is named after him, and that is called Apollinarianism. So we've talked in, in previous weeks about modalism and Arianism, and those are theological heresies. Uh, they diverge from the correct understanding of God, and in different ways they deny the Trinity. Uh, they deny that there is one God and three distinct coexisting persons, and they're kind of um, on two opposite ends of the spectrum there as far as denying the Trinity. But Apollinaris, he did accept the Trinity. He was on Athanasius' side, and so he successfully kind of made it past that fork in the road, if we want to look at it that way. He stayed on the right path when it came to understanding the Trinity. The issue that Apollinaris had is that Apollinar Apollinarianism is a Christological heresy. So Christological is kind of a big word, but it basically means that it's pertaining to the doctrine or an understanding of the second person of the Trinity, the understanding of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus, what he has done, what he is doing, what he will be doing. That would be, those would be items of, of Christology. So Apollinarianism is a Christological heresy. So what did he teach? Where did he diverge from orthodoxy? Where did he take the wrong road, if you will? Apollinaris denied the full and distinct natures of Christ, his divine nature and his human nature in one person. So he, so he did not accept that Christ had two, has two natures in one person. So, so before we kind of analyze that in a little bit more detail, let's make sure we understand what is the orthodox position. And that is that Christ is fully God and fully man, that he has two natures but one person. And the theological term to describe that is the hypostatic union. And again, we have a, a big theological term, but basically it's a word to describe how God the Son, Jesus Christ, took on a human nature yet remained fully God. So the Son of God is eternal, but at the incarnation he became fully man while still retaining his divine nature in one person. Okay, so... That's kind of a lot to think about, and like the Trinity, it's something that we can articulate, but it remains beyond our full comprehension, okay? How exactly does that work? It's, it's difficult to, to describe that, to understand that. It's a, a mystery. So what Apollinaris did is he attempted to simplify that complexity, that mystery, uh, much like we see Sibelius did with modalism and Arius did with Arianism. Same, not, didn't simplify in the same way, but tries to simplify uh, mystery into a way that's easier to understand. So, what did Apollinaris say? Well, he affirmed that the Son, the second person of the Trinity, took on flesh in the Incarnation. But he denied that the two natures, God and man, could exist within one person. So basically he's saying God, uh, Christ cannot simultaneously be fully God and fully man. And so to resolve that, he, he presented or proposed that Christ has a human body, but no human mind. And so in other words, uh, the human body of Christ had a mind, and that mind is uh, the logos. And if you don't recognize that word in John 1 verse 1, uh, where, where John writes that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, where we read Word in English, uh, in Greek, that's Logos. So that's the Logos of God. So in other words, according to Apollinaris, with Christ, his physical substance is man, but his spiritual substance is God. So as we think about, um, we think about his idea here that... Uh, Christ did not have a human mind, it's important to understand that a mind is not the same thing as a brain, okay? We often sort of associate, if we had to pick a body part to associate the mind with, we'd probably pick a brain, but the brain is not the mind. The brain is material, whereas mind is spiritual. Now, obviously, our minds can be very impacted by material things, but yet it is a spiritual thing. So, as humans, we have um, we are both physical and spiritual. We have, obviously, material substance, but we also have a mind that is a spiritual thing and isn't something that you can, can touch. 
right? You can touch a brain, but you can't touch a mind. So, um, according to Apollinaris, Christ had that physical sense of humanity. You know, he had a body, something you could touch, but he did not have a human mind. He didn't have the spiritual element of humanity. So, in other words, according to Apollinaris, Christ is part God and part man. And so therefore, if we kind of extrapolate that out, we end up with that Christ is really neither truly God nor truly man, and is in a sense a hybrid, essentially, of the two. So if you think of a, a mule is a hybrid of a horse and a donkey, and, and in the same way, that's kind of what Apollinaris is saying about Christ. He's a hybrid between God and man. So he's, so he's part God, he's part man, but ends up being neither God nor man. So again, according to Apollinaris, Jesus has a human body, but spiritually is not human. If you looked at him, you would say, okay, yeah, absolutely, he looks like a human, he must be a human, but Christ, according to Apollinaris, is different from you and me, not, because, not just because he's sinless, but because Christ is essentially something different, okay? So Apollinaris would say, Jesus looks like a man, but he's not a man. Now, does that sound familiar? Does that sound similar to anything that we've talked about previously in this series? He, Jesus looks like a man, but he's not actually a man. Maybe you don't remember the name, but we talked about it previously. Uh, it's related pretty closely or, or adopted or used by Gnostics, but a heresy called docetism, which is basically that Jesus looks like a man, but wasn't a man. Um, so Apollinaris kind of um, dresses it up a little bit more, maybe, puts a little bit more of an explanation on it, but that's kind of, that's basically at the root of Apollinarianism, docetism. Jesus looked like a man, but he wasn't. Now, even if Apollinaris wouldn't have necessarily put it that way, taking the path that he's chosen, if we follow it all the way, that's where it leads us, that Jesus looks like a man, but really is not. So take a moment to think. What would be the appeal of that position? What would be the appeal of Apollinarianism? That Christ has a human body, but does not have a human mind. Why would someone want to adopt that standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it simplifies things, right? We don't have to comprehend or try to comprehend that Christ has two full natures in one person. That's difficult for our human minds to, to grasp. So absolutely, it simplifies things to where I can clearly define this. This is, this is what it is. I can understand that. I can, I can hold on to that. I think that's probably the main thing. Um, if, if, if Gnostic sentiments are something that is appealing to you, appealing to someone, Apollinarianism does incorporate some of those things. The, the Gnostic sentiment of there being an essential distinction within man between the physical and the spiritual. So it's kind of, again, going down that path where it takes us. If, if Christ could have a human body but not a human mind, that's suggestive of the fact that the human body and human minds that we have are essentially distinct, and so that um, if you remember with Gnosticism, one of the key ideas of that is that the body is, is flawed, is corrupt, is evil, but the spirit is good, and so the idea is kind of you want to separate those things. Well, with, uh, with, with humanity, where you know, we have a mind and a body, those things go together, and while when we die, there is a separation, the end result, the final, um, the final state, for humanity is that the body and the, and the mind are together, that the spiritual and the physical are together. That's God's plan. Um, in the final resurrection, you know, we are raised with a body. Um, so humans are supposed to have a body. Those things aren't um, in, an, in, et in an eternal state distinct. So if you, but if you like the idea of having sort of a definite um, eternal distinction between mind and body, Apollinarianism could appeal to that. So simplification, though, I think probably is the most common appeal of Apollinarianism. But probably most people who 
hold an Apollinarist view don't realize that they hold an Apollinarist view and just kind of fall into it by a lack of understanding. Basically, they have an accidental assumption. So people would just sort of tend to fall into thinking about Christ in this way, again, because it's easier. So not that they've set out, like, you know, I'm going to, I don't believe what the Bible says, you know, I'm going to teach this heresy, um, but rather they just aren't aware of what the truth is, and so they kind of fall into this because it's simple and sort of makes sense to our human minds. Um, now, un, and I think that we can kind of see that in the fact that um, unlike some of the other heresies that we've discussed, as f- to my knowledge from what my research was, there are no groups that hold to Apollinarianism today. They don't teach that as doctrine. However, I think that probably you would find, if you asked people the right questions, that they would have this assumption about Christ. Again, not because they're out there to, because you know, they believe that's the right thing in, in the face of Scripture, but because they just don't necessarily understand um, the two natures of Christ in hypostatic union. Um, so, again, those are probably the primary appeals of Apollinarianism. Uh, but if we could put on maybe an Apollinarianist hat, what might they appeal to in Scripture, either verses or concepts to promote this view? Jesus has a human body, but not a human mind. Well, if we think about um, John chapter 1, again, where, where John is talking about the word, the logos. John, 1, John chapter 1, verse 14, the apostle writes, And the word, again, that's logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Apollinarianists might argue that the word becoming flesh there, the flesh does not extend behind the physical. A lot of times when we would think of the word flesh, we think of a body, a physical thing. Uh, and not human nature as a whole. Um, another, another verse they might point to, Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, uh, referring to Christ, uh, it says, But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. Okay, so there, there the Apostle Paul is saying the likeness of a man, the appearance of a man, so the Apollinarius could argue, you'll see he just appeared, Uh, to be a man. He looked like a man, but wasn't necessarily a man. So if you think about those those two arguments there, um, before we get into any biblical arguments, any arguments from Scripture um, to counter Apollinarianism, we still can counter those points just based on their own merits. If we we don't even have to look at the, you know, the context of Scripture, we can just take those two arguments and we can make a counter argument and that is this, that neither one specifically and explicitly limits Jesus to adopting only the physical aspect of humanity. So even if we take the term flesh in John chapter 1, if if we just take it to mean only a physical body and not human nature in total, there's no preclusion there of the spiritual. There's no preclusion of Jesus taking on the full nature. So John could say Jesus took on a human body, but he's not He doesn't, in the same statement, say he did not take on a human mind. And same thing with uh, Philippians chapter 2. Someone who is a man would have the likeness of a man. Someone who is a man would have the appearance of a man. Now, he would have more than that, but but not less either. Okay, so someone who is truly and fully man will have the likeness of a man and appear to be a man. But we can counter the ideas of Apollinarianism a little more um, specifically, uh, a little more offensively from Scripture. Um, Can you think of any verses, or even if not a verse, but a concept from Scripture that you might appeal to to refute Apollinarianism, to refute the idea that Jesus had a human body but not a human mind?
Okay. Yeah, so I, I don't think the Apollinarius would say that Jesus didn't have a supernatural, didn't have a supernatural, didn't have power over nature. Um, but that, they would say that he does, but that's because he has a divine mind. And they're just saying, we don't, you know, the human mind, that, 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 that's not there. So he's doing that by the divine power that he has due to his divine, divine mind. Okay, yeah, so you have that spiritual element of Jesus being given up. He's dying. Can a, divi- can, can a divine person, or can a divine um, nature die? No. So that's the human, the human nature of, of Jesus that is dying there. So yeah, so there's a, there's a distinction made there in Scripture um, a, between a human a human spirit, um, a human nature. Uh, oh. Yeah, um, particular, I think, probably in regards to the fact that um, the divine mind of God cannot be tempted to sin. The divine mind of God cannot sin. Um, so, so, yeah, the, uh, the devil would be would be tempting Jesus in his humanity. Yeah, uh, a couple of other a couple of other verses. Um, Luke two fifty two. Luke says, "And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom. Can God increase in wisdom? No, He cannot. So Jesus, His human mind is is increasing in wisdom. Um, then at the end of Jesus' life, Luke chapter twenty two forty two. Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus is referring to a distinct will from the Father. That would be his human, his human will, his human mind. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Okay, so there, there the Apostle Paul is not saying, um, you know, there's one God, one mediator, also between God and men, the guy who looks like a man, Christ Jesus. No, the man, Christ Jesus. So those are some specific verses. Um, another specific verse that we can look at in light of this axiom, which is this, what Christ did not assume, he could not redeem. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So through Adam, the human race was corrupted. And through Adam, because of his sin, all are sinners and all die. But in Christ all of God will be made alive. So just as by a man came death, by a man came the resurrection of the dead. By a man, not by someone who looks like a man, but by a man. And of course, that is, that is Jesus Christ. So what, the, what we can draw out of that, what the apostle Paul is getting to there, in terms of how it addresses Apollinarianism, or what we would take as we're looking to refute that idea, is this, that if Christ is not fully man, his work is not of significance to us, right? Adam's sin, Adam's fall is significant to us because he is a man and we are also men. By him, humanity was corrupted, and so it takes a man to redeem man, and that is Jesus Christ. So stepping back from those more specific things and looking at kind of a broader concept or something we see throughout, Uh, 23 times in the Gospels, Jesus is referred to as the Son of God, sometimes by himself, more often by others. But more frequently, Jesus refers to himself as what? As the Son of Man. So there's a number of reasons that that's significant, but for our purposes here today, it speaks to Jesus' human nature. So we say Jesus is the Son of God. He is of the same 
essence as the Father. He has divine essence. So similarly, for Jesus to be the Son of Man, he has the same essence, the same nature as man. And that's something that we see Jesus refer, that's a way we see Jesus refer to himself regularly um, throughout his, his life. So that is an important thing to, to take note of. Now, I, I reference an axiom, what Christ did not assume, he could not redeem. Um, as we step away from scripture and, and then look to um, how, how the creeds have addressed the ideas of Apollinarianism, um, that, that axiom is a reflection of the work of the Council of Chalcedon, which uh, was held in the 5th century. And that council produced a definition that addressed the relationship between Christ's divine and human natures. And I apologize, I intended to have a PowerPoint with it, with it, with it written on because it's kind of lengthy, um, but there was an issue with saving the file and it, it, it got lost. So um, it is fairly lengthy and I... I guess I'll just go ahead and, and read through all of it, um, and, I'll, and I'll just highlight the things that pertain particularly to this. Uh, so this is, this is from the Council of Chalcedon. Following then the Holy Father, Fathers, we all unanimously teach that our Lord Jesus Christ is to us one and the same Son, the self-same perfect in Godhead, the self-same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man. Again, not truly God and looking like a man, but truly God and truly man. The self-same of a rational soul and body, co-essential with the Father, according to the Godhead. The self-same co-essential with us, according to the manhood, like us in all things, in all things, sin apart. So, like us in all ways, except that he is without sin. Before the ages begotten of the Father as to the Godhead, but in the last days, the self-same for us and for our salvation, born of Mary the Virgin, Theotokos as to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, acknowledged in two natures, unconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The difference of the two natures being in no way removed because of the union, but rather the properties of each nature being preserved and both concurring into one person and one hypostasis, not as though he were parted or divided into two persons, but one and the selfsame Son and only begotten God, Word, Lord, Jesus Christ, even as from the beginning the prophets have taught concerning him, and as the Lord Jesus Christ himself hath taught us, and as the symbol of the fathers hath handed down to us. So pretty, pretty explicit there at several points that Jesus is fully God and fully man, but one person. So you can, if you've, if you've kind of tracked with these heresies, you see they kind of swing from one direction to the other, overcompensating. And that, that's really was Apollinarian, Apollinarius' issue, right? He was adamantly opposed to Arius, but he went too far in the other direction um, and ended up in heresy on the other side of the road, basically. So if you know, this is the correct path. Arius went over here. Apollinarius went over this way. Okay, so um, the council's work here also um, sort of preempts going in the other direction from Apollinarianism to say, okay, yes, Jesus is fully God and fully man and therefore is two persons. No, he is one person, fully human, fully God in one person. So, Again, Apollinarianism, the idea that Christ is human in his body. He has a human body. He looks human, but he does not have a human mind, a human, a human spirit. He, is, he has no human mind, and instead just the logos in a human body, essentially. So as we've been looking at these heresies, we've been looking at them especially in light of what is the cruelty that they inflict? What is the harm that they do? They're not true, okay? And that's an issue in and of itself, but... What's the negative effect? What's the harm that they do to um, those that would, would believe them, would hold to them? What's the cruelty of Apollinarianism? How is it harmful? Right, yeah, absolutely. He, he, uh, if he doesn't have a human mind, he looked pretty good, but 
there's still a different, he's not, he's not like us. Yeah, he's not something that we can, can follow really because he's not the same, he's not the same as we are. So in addition to if Apollinarian is more true, in addition to Christ being someone that we really couldn't follow, he's also someone that could not really save, right? Because he's not fully man. Um, if, if by one man human nature is corrupted and by another man we have life, well, if Jesus isn't a man, then he's not the man and I don't know who is, okay? So he cannot save. But if we want to argue that he can save, and this would be, I mean, Apollinarius obviously was saying that Jesus could save. So if Jesus could save, then it would be accomplished by destroying the human mind. So we would have to become like Christ. We would have to have no human mind. The human mind would have to be destroyed. It would have to be replaced. It would have to be eliminated. But that's not the idea that we see in Scripture. Romans 12, 2, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So there Paul is not saying the human mind is replaced, but that it is renewed. Okay, I, this week I have to renew my vehicle registration. It's up at the end of the month. I have a Subaru Forester. When I pay PennDOT and they send me a PDF of the registration card, it's not going to be a registration card for a Lamborghini. It's not, it's not a different car that I'm registering. It's the same. It's being renewed, okay? So um, sort of a, a very base analogy for something much more grand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he, again, he's something different than us, so he can't, he can't sympathize with us. Um, also from Hebrews, um, chapter 10, 16, and 17, where the writer's quoting Jeremiah, chapter 31, it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then say, says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So the work of God there is on their mind and not a replacement mind. Again, so the human mind um, is, not, is not replaced, it's not destroyed in salvation, but it is renewed, it's made new. Um, so again, Apollinarian salvation you know, if we, want to, if we want to call it that, really only addresses the body. That's all that Jesus could redeem, since that's all that he had, um, since that's all that his humanity was. Go ahead, Jen. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's a great example, and throughout we see Jesus expressing, throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus expressing things that are clearly from a human, a human mind, because he is human, and, and because he's human, as Pastor Taylor said, he can, he can sympathize with us, and he is that, um, he's that mediator between God and man. He is both God and man, and so that's why he can be a perfect mediator, um, because he is, he is God, and he is man, fully in, in both natures, yeah, one person. Um, so where this sort of Apollinarian salvation, limited, weak, failing, not true, um, if Jesus could only redeem the body, because that's all his humanity was, that, that's insufficient for our failures, for our sinfulness, because it's true that our bodies do sometimes lead us to sin, right? The person who's starving 
might steal some bread. His physical, his, his physical body was a thing that, that led him into sin. But more often, it's our minds that lead us into sin. Uh, things like pride, self-will, idolatry, those are, those, are, those are mind things. Those aren't physical body problems that cause us to sin. Um, so, we, so, you know, the, the salvation, the redemption that we need is, is while well, we need, while, well, you know, the physical aspect of us certainly is flawed, it's the minds, of, it's our minds that are particularly in need of, of renewal and redemption. So if we kind of continue down that track of this sort of Apollinarian salvation where the body is redeemed and the mind is destroyed, we've also, in destroying the mind, also really destroyed humanity, okay? Because if, if a human is both physical and spiritual, if you destroy it, part of that, you've, you've, the whole thing is no longer really human. And so Apollinarianism is really anti-human in that it sees men as irredeemable. They have to be made into something else. They have to, in a sense, be spiritually lobotomized in order to be, to be redeemed. But that's not how God views man, right? God views man as redeemable. And that's why he, he redeemed us, because he, he viewed us in that way. Um, so Jesus, of course, saves, um, and God also sanctifies those he saves to be like the humanity of the perfect man. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a perfect man, certainly in the fact that he is sinless, but he is also perfect in his complete human nature. Um, so it's been, it's been said of docetism, this idea that Jesus looked like a man but wasn't really, that docetism is really escapism. Um, since since Jesus was not really man, then we do not really need to be men either. And that is where salvation is, in being less human. It's an escape from humanity. Um, and, and Apollinarianism falls into that category where to be saved, we've got to destroy, we've got to destroy the mind, replace the mind, not really be human anymore. Um, but that's not what we see in Scripture where Jesus is fully God, absolutely, 100%. God is, or Jesus is also fully man, absolutely, 100%, and both of those things um, are, are essential. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned Irenaeus. Uh, he lived some time before Apollinaris did, um, so he wasn't writing directly to confront the ideas that uh, Apollinaris was putting out, but his writing does refute uh, some of the docetistic ideas that Apollinarianism assumes. Ap um, Irenaeus writes, the Son of God has become a Son of Man, and also, Jesus Christ is true man and true God. And really, the, the Council of Chalcedon was kind of building uh, upon those ideas. Uh, but Irenaeus' message can be summarized as this. Christ's person and work was to reunite God and humanity, to undo Adam's disobedience and defeat by his obedience and victory, and so restore to humanity both the image and likeness of God. And I think the biggest tragedy... Uh, or cruelty of Apollinarianism, that it really, um, it really guts the beauty of what God has done in Christ. Um, to, uh, again, we can't, we can't really wrap our minds all the way around the idea of, of Christ being fully God, fully man, two distinct natures, but one person. And the fact that we can't wrap our mind around that shouldn't lead us to then try to simplify it so that we can and end up believing a lie but it should, it should just cause us to worship God and, and to, to meditate on him in, in praise and worship. Um, does anybody have any questions before we, before we conclude or any other comments or anything? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, our time again this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to, to um, discuss these, these uh, great and important matters. Uh, thank you for, for sending your son not just to look like us, um, but to be a man, to be like us in every way uh, except sin. And I thank you that uh, not only did you send him to be a man, but also to die, to restore us to you. Thank you for the renewing of our minds that you work through the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that um, even as we maybe contemplate uh, these things, and they're difficult to understand, of course, 
Um, how could we fully understand you? You are so far above us. But I pray that 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 challenge that we don't like to not know, we don't like to not understand fully, we don't like to feel like we can't quite wrap our minds around it, around things, but I pray that instead of driving us to sort of simplify and make it work in some way that that cheapens cheapens Christ, cheapens you, that instead we would we would worship you, that we would thank you, and that we would live lives of praise to you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.